I've taken care of thousands of patients, but nothing prepared me for my own illness three years ago. You see, I'd always been that person that bounded out of bed at ungodly hours to go exercise and liked it. I would round on my patients in the hospital and the office. I would take care of my beautiful children. And I truly, truly lived, live a charmed life. What I did not know or realize was that over time, the stress of my job, my exercise, my diet was slowly eroding my health until one day I was so tired, I couldn't get out of bed. And my clinician side of my brain clicked in and thought, I'm not depressed, what could be going on? I was so tired that I didn't have enough energy to take care of not only myself, but my family, my own patients. I gained weight. I had crazy food cravings, and anyone that knows me knows that I love to eat healthy, and suddenly I was craving chocolate like it was my job. I couldn't sleep. Oh, I couldn't sleep. I didn't appreciate sleep enough until I didn't have it. I was bloated. I had no libido. All the things that you don't want to have happen. And I was completely stunned because I thought, I'm doing everything right. What am I doing wrong? What is my body trying to tell me? What am I not listening to? And part of this TEDx is showing up. And so part of me showing up is talking about something I find embarrassing and awkward. And let's be honest. Let's be honest. No one wants to talk about forbidden topics. But I'm going to talk about menopause. Every woman in this room, if they've either gotten there or they're approaching it or it's 20 years down the road, it's all something that's such a forbidden topic. I want you to think about something. Menopause is when a woman can no longer conceive a child naturally. We have technology nowadays that can sometimes make that happen. And you no longer get your periods. But prior to that, there are five to seven years, sometimes 10, where a woman is going through perimenopause, a word I had never heard of before. And I trained at a big research institution in the States, never heard of it. Never had a conversation with my OBGYN, my midwife, no one until I went through this whole process. So I want you to think about the fact that women go through this process and they come out on the other side, but there's so little information. There was actually this past week in a big um, US publication newspaper, they were talking about second puberty and they were talking about how there's such little information about this time in a woman's life and people don't feel comfortable talking about it. So let's get back to that story I was telling you about. I went from being fit and buff to suddenly being bloated, tired, and grumpy with no seemingly end to what was going on with my body. So let's talk a little bit about some statistics. It's important to define what's going on. We know the American Congress of OBGYNs estimates that 6,000 women a day that's a startling amount, 6,000 a day go into menopause. It's over 2 million a year, and yet we don't talk about it. And women can begin this process of perimenopause in their late 30s. And if you're in your 40s, you're already there. So when you think about looking back in 1900, the average life expectancy for a woman was 47 years old. Do you want to know why that statistic, when I read it, pained me? Because I'm 47 years old. And back in 1900, that would have been the end of the line, probably. In 2018, it's 84 years old. So what does that mean? That means that 40% of a woman's life, if she lives long enough, will be in menopause. 40% of her life. Conventional wisdom suggests this is the end. I'm here to tell you it's just the beginning. <sighs> Over 20 years of working as a nurse and a nurse practitioner, I heard countless examples of women expressing concerns that weren't being readily addressed 
or being addressed with antidepressants, sleeping pills, or suggestions of therapy. And I'm not suggesting that maybe there are a few of those who might have needed a few of those things. However, what I want everyone to understand is that we're missing opportunities with women. We're missing opportunities to address these times, to talk about these things, so that people have the tools to be able to look forward to this point in their lives and not look at it as they're dreading it's the end of the earth. You probably have had conversations or you've spoken with people where they think, oh gosh, this is the end of the line. I don't believe and nor do I subscribe to limiting to beliefs of any kind. Now, I'm going to let you in on all the, ticks and the tra all the tricks of the trade of how you can navigate this time in your life proactively as opposed to reactively. You know, I'm Western medicine trained. We deal with symptoms. I'm functional trained, which means we look for root cause. So I'm going to let you in on all my secrets, the things that I recommend that I talk to women about every single day so that you can live the best life possible. I always start with food. I love to talk about food. Who doesn't? Let's talk about food. Does anyone have any idea where digestion starts in your body? It doesn't matter if I ask a five-year-old, if I'm lecturing to a group of elementary school age kids or an adult. No one ever guesses it, but think about it. Digestion starts in our brains. If our brains are not actively engaged in the process of accepting food, we're never going to digest it properly. And this is when women really start to struggle with digestion. So think about it this way. How many of us stand when we're eating? We eat in our cars. We eat while we're working. We eat while we're yelling at our spouse, our kids, our parents, whomever. I mean, we're all guilty, right? I encourage each of you to just try this out. I want you to take an opportunity, take a couple deep breaths, and sit undistracted. Don't sit in front of your computer or your TV or your phone or your tablet or you know, being distracted by anything. Just enjoy the process of eating. You have to tap into that parasympathetic, the rest and repose side of our brains. So, so important. That's the first thing to do. You know, in the United States, we have something called the standard American diet. It's not something I'm proud of to say. Highly processed foods. There are lots of chemicals in those foods that our bodies don't know what to do with. I want you to think about the quality of food that you're putting in your body. And by that, I mean less processed food, more highly pigmented fruits and vegetables. Yes, more color on your plate is good. I want you to think about the quality of protein, the best that your budget will actually allow you to enjoy. Ideally, pastured or organic meat, wild-caught fish. And when you're thinking about fats, and fats are so important, and you want to talk about guilt of many, many years of telling my patients, I want you to have low-fat, non-fat garbage. You want the real thing. We don't want canola oil. We don't want soybean oil. We don't want cottonseed oil. They're highly processed oftentimes rancid before they get to the grocery store and very inflammatory. Not good for us, ladies. Inflammation equals weight gain. We don't want that. So think about things like grass-fed butter and ghee and nuts and seeds, avocado and coconut oil are all great for your body. Our brains like healthy fats. Our bodies like healthy fats. That's how we build healthy for hormones. That's how we cushion our joints. That's how we stay satiated when we eat a meal. Here's a caveat, carbohydrates are not all bad, but quality and quantity when you are making this transition are super important. Super, super important. That is the slip up that everyone makes a mistake with. So quality of carbohydrates and quantity. So quality means green leafy vegetables, lots of low glycemic berries, not cakes and cookies and pies and pasta and bread. And yes, they're delicious but that should not be the basis of our diet. That gets us into trouble. I want you to think about the fact that when you consume too many of those kinds of carbohydrates, they spike your blood sugar, they spike your insulin, they lead to insulin resistance if you consume them too frequently, too often. And we already are dealing with blood sugar problems when we get towards menopause. It is a given. We don't maintain our blood sugar as well. So 
Good quality carbohydrates, less of them. We don't need a lot of carbs. We need some, but not a lot. I want you to think about my, my absolute favorite tactic that I'm gonna lump into nutrition is intermittent fasting. Anyone ever heard of it? It is a deal breaker. It is the magic bullet. It is why I can say at 47, I feel like I am 20 years younger than I am. It is really simple. There's no really wrong way to do it. You eat less food because you shorten your feeding window. Some people do a 16 hour fast today. Some people do 18 hours. I promise you, you can survive without eating breakfast. There are of course people who shouldn't do this, but that's a whole other topic. Intermittent fasting is the magic bullet. Think about it. It is a total deal breaker. Next. There are specific supplements that are really fantastic. Even if you haven't gone into perimenopause yet, are really great for balancing hormones. Easy things that you can integrate into your diet on a daily basis. First is something called maca. Ever heard of it? Maca is actually a tuber that grows in the ground. It's called Peruvian ginseng. It is absolutely amazing. It helps balance hormones. It is great for energy. It's great for PMS. It's great for hot flashes and it's great for libido. So when I have women who are really struggling with this, it's I credit it for one of those things that helps give me energy that I can use every single day. It's a naturally occurring substance. Next are adaptogenic herbs like ashwagandha, rhodiola rosea. Those are the two best researched and studied. They are helpful for energy. They are helpful for reducing anxiety. They are helpful for you know, balancing um, balancing cortisol, which is one of those stress hormones, and they are naturally occurring, things that you can consume in your diet. And I think the thing to mention is every single thing I'm talking about is stuff that I'm doing and that women are doing successfully and easily. Sleep. Oh God, I didn't, I didn't appreciate sleep enough until I didn't have good quality sleep for a while. Sleep is foundational to our health. I cannot overemphasize how important it is to sleep well and to prioritize it. You do not get a badge of honor if you get three or four hours of sleep and brag about it all the time. It is not a badge of honor. It is detrimental to your health, destructive and not good to do. So what am I gonna recommend? Seven, eight hours a night of sleep every single night. It has to be a priority. Cold, dark room. I want you to turn off your electronics, I know, 60, 90 minutes before you go to bed. Why? There is blue light that comes, junk light, comes out of that electronic, your phone, your iPad, your tablet, your computer, that disrupts secretion of a hormone in your brain called melatonin. And if that's off, you are not gonna go to bed. How many people get wired and tired when they're up on their computers late at night? Happens to me. Here's the one thing, if you have to be on your computer because you're working, I'm a realist, you can wear blue blocking glasses. Two really great brands, Swannies and Uvex. Different price points work really effectively, but it blunts the blue light that's coming from the electronics that can be so troublesome with sleep. If you want to get even a little more crazy, turn off your Wi-Fi at night. I know everyone gas. I can't do that. Yes, you can. Turn off your Wi-Fi. We know it dysregulates cortisol in the body. Cortisol is one of those hormones tapped into the adrenal glands can absolutely do it. Here's the, another caveat. Not enough sleep, what are you going to crave? You're not going to crave vegetables. You're going to crave junk. You're going to crave carbs and not the good kind of carbs. So sleep so that you keep those cravings at bay. The other thing I want you to consider is that if you don't get enough sleep, good quality sleep, deep sleep, you will have a 40% inability, 40% reduction in being able to balance your blood sugar. Why does that matter? Remember we talked about blood sugar is not well controlled. You end up dealing with insulin issues. You can, you can be insulin resistant. You can have diabetes, which is diabetes and obesity. They typically go together. More inflammation, more adrenal stress. You got to get the sleep. Got to get the sleep. Has to be a priority. And frankly, what starts to happen is those of us that are middle-aged, I'm going to own it on stage. I'm middle-aged. Those of us that are middle-aged need more sleep or as much sleep as our teenagers. So I have, t I have a tween and a teen. I sleep probably as much, if not more, than they do. And my body needs it. And I'm going to embrace it. 
stress management. I know one of the earlier talks we were talking about tapping into this parasympathetic rest and repose, relaxation mode in our bodies. This is one of the hardest things that I found I had to start prioritizing. I can do a CrossFit class and I can do all sorts of crazy things and go, 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 go. But what I really struggled with was slowing down. So restorative yoga, Tai Chi, Pilates, bar, more of that and less crazy things that are getting, spiking your cortisol and getting you going. The mindfulness act actions of meditation, super, super important. We know that mindfulness meditation actually changes the structure of our brains. It's called neuroplasticity. I love this big nerdy word. Neuroplasticity. We want more of that in our lives. You want to cultivate the side of your brain and your body. This is super important to be prioritizing. You also want to think about gentle movement. You know, I touched on a few of those things, but even putting your feet on this time of year, probably not doing it in Toronto, but getting your feet in the grass when the weather's a little warmer, grounding work, getting outside and just walking, very, very important. And last but not least, just being grateful. You don't have to write, you know, sometimes I hear people talk about gratitude journaling. That's great. I don't have the mindset to do that per se. Write down two things you're grateful for every day. We all have time for that. These are practices that we can all make time for that are so important for nurturing our brains and our hormones and our bodies. So getting back to the original intent of talking about the showing up. So coming full circle, recognizing that we have to invest in ourselves. You know, we as women do a really great job of taking care of everyone else. We do such a good job with that. We don't do such a great job taking care of us as individuals. So when you're sitting with your BFF and she starts to talk about how she's dreading these years of menopause, the night sweats, the hot flashes, all of these things that sound so detrimental, I want you to be able to reflect back on this talk. And whether or not it's your best friend or it's your mom or it's some other loved one or, loved one or person in your life, you can think there are things you can be doing right now that are very proactive, that can ensure that you go from not just surviving, but to thriving. Because I think when you reflect on the fact that most women will spend 40% of their lives after menopause, don't we want it to be the best that it can actually be? Thank you.